The book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians and chapter 3. As you know, we're doing some studies in the book of Colossians. It's a wonderful book. got so much to offer us, so much that would help us. Now, let me give you three things. I wrote down three things. These are not things you have to write down, but they're the three things that I want to give to you that I believe will help you. It, ha it helped me years ago when I understood these three little things that I want to give to you. Number one, if you can get upset because you're not top dog, can you still get upset because you are? Think about it. If you can get upset because you're not top dog, can you still get upset because you are a top dog? Now, I want you to think about this. Let me give you another statement. Do you realize that to some people, your present position is top dog to someone else? Do you realize that to some people, your present position is top dog to someone else. You once thought that also. You used to think, boy, if I could do what you're doing right now, at one time in your life, you'd be top dog. You'd be so pleased. You'd be so blessed if you could just do what you're doing. But there's something about human nature. We are always wanting what? More. We always want more. We're never satisfied. We're always grabbing for more. Have you ever heard about it with rich people? Boy, if I got a million, that's all I'd want. Then they've got to have another one. And then another one. How much is enough? Well, according to the present administration, you don't need that much. What does that mean? They want it. Somebody wants it. I've had people say, Yankee, you have absolutely too much power. What they mean is, they want some. I've had people tell me this, Yankee, I don't want you dictating things to me. So what they want is to dictate to me. It's amazing, we never see it the way things sometimes really are, because of our perspective. Well, in the book of um, Colossians, it's trying to help us to get a proper perspective. See, there's a divine perspective and a human perspective, and sometimes people can't seem to tell the difference. But another statement I wanted to give you. If we murmur and complain about the job or position we don't have, then we don't deserve the one we do have. Let me read it to you again, because you didn't get it. If we murmur and complain about the job or position we don't have, then we don't deserve the one we do have. You ever heard of a story in the Bible about a guy named Saul, first king? Do you realize that Saul was the first king he was head and shoulders above everybody. He had it made. I mean, he was exactly what the people were looking for. But did you know there came a time in his life when he despised God blessing somebody else? Do you realize that you ought to be thrilled to death that God is using you? And you need to be thrilled to death that God uses somebody else. Did you know that part of serving the Lord is being blessed by seeing what God does in the lives of everyone else? You want everyone to be blessed by God. You want everyone to be used by God. Don't you? You don't have to be top dog on anything, do you? It's so easy preaching and hard living. But that is what the book of Colossians is talking about, this very thing. Now, God says that when we trusted Christ as our Savior, we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ. 
were with the Lord. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he rose from the dead, I rose from the dead. When he ascended, I ascended. And I am seen in the heavenlies in Christ. He is my life. When you and I were born again, we were born from above. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where your citizenship is. You see, we're just down here temporarily. As a child of God, God allowed us to come into this world temporarily. Just for a short period of time. So that we would have an opportunity to lay up treasures in heaven. Because see, once you're in heaven, you can't lay up treasure in heaven. You can only do it from here. But you're supposed to keep heaven in view. We live on the earth remembering who we are, child of God. Where we came from, heaven. And that I'm here temporarily in order to gain rewards. And then I'll be going back. So if you can understand that, it can help you. God, see, has done some wonderful things for us, given us opportunities to live. We didn't ask for it. Just that's the way it is. God gave us the freedom to choose whether or not we would spend in eternity with the Lord or in hell. I'm so thankful for the person who explained to me how to have eternal life. I was 18 years old. Heard it for the first time. And so far, in another 52 years since then, nobody has ever talked to me about how to go to heaven. Nobody's ever tried to win me to Christ. In all these years, except that one man, boy, am I glad he didn't miss me. But he went to be with the Lord in heaven. And uh, before he left, he told me an awful lot of things about heaven. I didn't know any of it. But it created a desire within me that I, I began to set my affections on things that are above. Because I began to realize I'm not here for long. I'm going there. And I want to please the one who saved me. I'm going to see God one of these days face to face. And I would love for him to say, Yankee, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So it doesn't matter if I've got money or no money, house or no house, good health, bad health. None of that matters. All that matters is, did you, with what you have, where you are, were you faithful? Were you faithful to please and to honor God? You see, we think that it's because of all the things in the world you can grab a hold of. And God says just the opposite. It was everything they could get rid of. Do you know the apostles when they were here? You realize how poor they were? I remember a statement made by Peter when they went into the temple. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Silver and gold have I none. Well, they must have been a failure. All just one of the, some of the most successful people in all the world. It all depends on perspective. You see there in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Look in verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For if ye are dead, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, we know that one day Jesus Christ is coming back in the air and he's going to take us out of this world. That's called the rapture. We'll be caught up and meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Seven years later, he's coming back in power and great glory to the earth. And he says, then shall we appear with him in glory. We're going to have glorified bodies, perfect bodies. He says, you're going to change these old vile bodies. We got an old sinful nature. We're getting old. We get sick. We get aches and pains. We start losing body parts. Everything seems to go downhill. See, this is my hope chest. Someday I hope that it'll be a chest. It ain't happened yet. I have to tell James Hayslip, he needs to do a little work on me. Give me. But I wouldn't mind looking like that, but it just seems like an awful lot of work. Just too much work. 
So uh, I just hope that God will just, you know, let me stay healthy enough until I can get done all that he wants me to do, and then I don't mind. See, I don't want to live forever. I just want to live long enough to bury the rest of y'all, and then I'll be ready to go. I mean, you got somebody's got to bury you. And he makes this statement here in verse 4, Then shall you also appear with him in glory. That day's coming. We're not there yet. We're still down here on planet Earth. And look what he says in verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now, here in verse 5, we have what is called the perverted love. You see, there's things that you love, but it's perverted love. Did you know that it's a perverted love that loves the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of love? That's perverted love. It's not the way that God intended it to be. God wants us to love him more than the things of this world. But most people love the world and the things of the world, and they work all their life just for the things of this world, and you're going to lose them. You're going to die one day, and you can't take anything with, with you. Naked you came into the world, and naked you shall return. And in between, you're going to get a little bit and lose a little bit. And when the Lord really blessed Job, he says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, when God gives you something, bless the Lord, O my soul. When the Lord takes it away, I'm sorry, this was your song. <laughs> Blessed is the Lord. Who giveth and taketh away. What kind of an attitude would you have if God took away your health? What kind of an attitude would you have toward God if he allowed all of your money to be gone? You say, that's already happened. <laughs> what if he took away a loved one? Will you turn against God? What could God allow to happen into your life to reveal to you that you don't really love him like you think you do? You see, God is a jealous God. It means that he doesn't want to be replaced. Idolatry is when you put something in place of God. You see, here's you and here's God. Anything you put between you and God, God can take and remove it. God doesn't want anything between you and him. And he can take anything and everything out of your life. Do you understand the power that God has? And that all of life is temporary, and you need to focus upon that which is heavenly. As he says in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Look at verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. But if you go ahead and you violate that, let's just say, okay, I'm a Christian. I have eternal life. I'm going to heaven when I die. And no, you can never lose your salvation. You can't go to hell today. You can't go to hell in the future. You can never go to hell. But you can, as a child of God, you can fall in love with the world. You can love yourself and make yourself God. And you can have a form of idolatry where you worship you and your will, your way, and not God's. But did you know that God says there's a price to pay? You may not have known that, but let me explain it to you. You see, God says that you and I have an old sinful nature. We got it when we were born into this world. It's in our body. It's the desires of the flesh. We are naturally children of rebellion. We want our own way. We're stubborn. We're hard-headed. We lie. We cheat. We deceive. You name the sin, and every one of us in this room is capable of committing it. You say, well, I would never do that. Don't ever say never. You'd be surprised what you are capable of doing. You just have some restraints upon you, but you can lose those restraints just like that. I know people have been married for 40 and 50 years, and all of a sudden, I don't want you no more. I'm going to trade you in for another model. That's why old Henry Ford was so successful. He says, I did my marriage like I did my business. One model. Y'all get that after a while. My dad used to have his old Model T. 
Well, anyway, look what he says in verse 5. The word mortify is where we get the word mortation or mortuary. It means to put to death, to render as dead. The desires that you have for the things of the world, because if you love the world, you're not going to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You're not going to take those desires that you have for the things of the world. You're not going to count them as dead. You're going to make sure they stay very much alive. Can you still love pornography? Yes, you can. All the filthy movies, you can love all of it, every bit of it. You can still commit adultery and fornication. You name the sin, you're capable of doing it. He says, even as a Christian, as a Christian. Now, most preachers will never tell you the truth. They'll lie to you because they don't understand it. You see, God loves me. He died and paid for my sin so that I can go to heaven whenever I die. I'm not going to heaven because I love God. I'm not going to heaven because I stop all my bad things. I'm going to heaven because 52 years ago in a little old living room, I believe Christ died and paid for all of my sins. There's no sins for me to pay for. I'm going to heaven. Some people say, well, that just gives you a license to sin. It's not a license to sin. It's the freedom to do right. I still have the old sinful nature. And yes, I can live like the devil and still go to heaven. And any preacher that tells you otherwise, he ain't worth a quarter. Don't support him and don't go to the church. He's lying to you. Eternal life is the gift of God. It's not of works before or after. But should I, as a child of God, should I do right? Should I serve the Lord? Yes. What I should do and what I must do is not the same thing. <clears throat> God will allow his children to still live a rebellious life. You can resist the Holy Spirit. You can do wrong. But God says it's a choice. And I want you to make the right choice. I want you to set your affections upon heaven. Think about where you're going. Because this is so short. You know, it wasn't long ago. I was, I was just a little baby. I remember as though it was yesterday. The first thing I remember after being born was hitting a bottle and being behind bars. I remember that. I remember hearing my daddy, he said this, the day I was born, he says, that's the ugliest kid I've ever seen in my life. Can you believe my daddy said that? He did. I had long, straight black hair all over my body. Head sideburns, hair going down my back. says, I look like a little monkey. He was going to put me in a burlap sack and throw me in the river and drown me. And my mama wouldn't let him. He says, is that true? Every word of it. I wouldn't lie to you for anything in the world. Raise my right hand. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. This body you have is a flesh body. You are up on the earth. But God wants you to live thinking about where you're going, to heaven. And there's things that God's going to reward you for if you obey him and serve him. So God says, when you get through down here with this life, you're going to be there. And when you get there, I want to reward you for what you did for me while you were here in this body upon the earth. So he says, even though you have a, a body that desires the things of the world, he said, I want you to set all of that aside and live by faith. Take me at my word. It'll be worth it. And you can think about the sex drive that you have. You can think about all the pornography and so forth in the world. And you can dwell on all that junk and trash if you want to. But there's something that's costing you. The things that you could have had when you get to heaven, that will be the treasures or the rewards or the positions that God has for you. The praise and the honor and the glory that you faithfully serve the Lord. And he meant more to you than all that trivial junk that's down here. Serve God. Put Him first in your life. Live now the way you wish you'd lived when you get to heaven. And so He says here, fornication. He says uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Concupiscence, that's just lusting. And when you talk about the, the fornication, 
All that is all manner of evils that you can think of. Where you get the word porneo. It's all the sexual sins and so on. God knows the desires of your flesh. God knows that. God knows. Oh, see that? When you see that good looking blonde, blonde, blonde bombshell walk by, you know, something on so tight you don't know if she's outside getting in or inside getting out. <laughs> I remember one time there was this little baby, it was a little kid, you know, running all over the, 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 the grocery store. Mommy, mommy, mommy. So how come you didn't hang on to her skirt? I uh, couldn't reach it. <laughs> Some people ain't got enough sense. They're about as, I guess you could say, as warped as a, the nearsighted turtle. Fell in love with an army helmet. <laughs> you can't see clearly. You can't see, you know, like, like the blind snake. Fell in love with a rope. You're learning to fall in love with the things that is junk, trash. And you don't use your discernment. You're just letting your natural desires of rebellion control your life. And some of you are well, you're going to ruin your marriage because of it. Some teenager is going to go for this hunk. Listen, all that muscle is going to go to the bottom. Just like all that beautiful hourglass figure she has. All the sand goes to the bottom sooner or later. And you're going to give up everything God has for you for this junk. Think about what you're doing. Set your affections on the things that God has for you. And you'd be surprised what God will do for you. Uh, look what else he says here. You see, in verse 5, it's uh, kind of giving you the idea about the impurities of the mind. The impurities of the mind... And it talks a little bit about, you know, sometimes the, the actions that are the result of the motives. And then in verse 8 and 9, you're talking about the motives that produce the actions. And so you're, you're looking at this and you're dwelling and trying to think. Of, you see, some of these things are, like in verse 5, talking about personal sins. And, and then down in verse 8, talking about your social sins. You see, the, against other people. Things you do to somebody. But there's all these results that comes from it. And he makes the statement there in verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. See, you still have an old sinful nature. You still have a body that desires the things of the world. And whether you're saved or lost, God hates sin. And God says that his wrath comes upon the children of disobedience. You may be a child of God, but if you're going to act like a child of disobedience, you need to understand. God will not force you to love him. He won't force you to serve him. You can live like you please. But there's a consequences to it. Everybody in this room can do exactly what you want to do. You can live any way you want to do, and you know it. I am a Christian. I am going to heaven when I die, and I can live any way I please. I can become as rebellious as I want to be. I can live as mean and ugly and as dirty as I want to, and I'm still going to heaven, not because I deserve it, but because of grace. God loved me that much that he paid for all of my sins, and he'll give me eternal life, and I go to heaven on what he did for me. I do not deserve that. But because I am God's child... I know that if I become a child of wrath, if I become a child of rebellion, he's my father. I'm God's child. And if I rebel against the will of my heavenly father, I know that my heavenly father, because he loves me, is going to beat the living daylights out of me. Maybe even take me home before my time. So you can't live as you please and get away with it. Understand that. But you can live as you please. Many adults' problems today is because, because they sowed wild oats when they were young. And now, years later, they reap wild oats. You reap what they call the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow, same thing you sowed, much later than you sowed. But a lot more, of course. So God says, 
I got something so much better for you. But I want you to put off something. In other words, there is responsibility. God holds us responsible for the decisions that we make. You can't hide behind, well, I just have a so sinful nature. No, it's just the way that I am. Yeah, everybody has that. But God doesn't accept that as an excuse. You're to be responsible for your decisions. You can also make right decisions. You can make godly decisions. And so he makes this statement in verse 8, excuse me, verse 7. In the which you also walked sometimes when you lived in them. You used to be a lost man. You had an old body with a sinful nature and that's what you did. But it looks like God wants you to live a different life after you're saved. Not to be saved. Not to prove you are saved. But because of what Christ has done for you, what he's done for me, God wants me to serve him. And he said, if I would serve him, he promised that he would bless me. I've looked over my life for the last 52 years, and I can say, God has blessed me. I don't have regrets, because I've tried to give the Lord all my years. And if he gives me another 10 years, I'd like to give him those, or whatever he else has left for me. You should want the will of God for your life, but you've got to set your affections on things that are above, not on things of this world. You're going to lose things down here. People aren't going to please you. People are not living to worship you. Chances are, their life doesn't revolve around you. If you die, they'll keep on a living. I mean, they'll mourn for a little while, a couple of days, and then you'll... You've got to understand, people have something about, it's me. Please me. Everybody make me happy. Nobody makes me happy. I'm down in the dumps. I'm miserable. Go out in the garden and eat worms. Your little pet rock died, you know. But look what he says. In verse uh, 8, he says, but now. But now. But now. That's the way you were. That's what you did. But now, he says, I uh, want you to know this. I want you to put off all these anger and wrath and malice, blasphemy. You see, anger and wrath and malice, see, that deals a lot with the way that you're thinking. It deals with your feelings. When you get hurt, you become bitter. And you get bitter, you get angry. And angry, you say things you shouldn't say, and it builds up into malice where you want to hurt somebody. And God says the external part of that there is the filthy communication out of the mouth. Because you see, how you think and how you feel, it's got to come out sooner or later. And it'll come out, but it's because of the focus in your life. It's what you love, what you're thinking about, what you're dwelling on. And so God says, out of your mouth. Look there in Ephesians in chapter 4. Just turn to your left just a few pages, but the book of Ephesians and chapter 4. And look in verse 29. See, this is talking to the Christian, to those that know the Lord, those that are going to heaven when they die. Not all of God's children automatically do right. That's why they have to be taught, to be trained. They have to be warned. They have to be rebuked at times. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, not edifying, edifying. Get this. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. You should say and do the things that you're trying to help and build up a person, (coughs) not tear them down. You see, your light doesn't become brighter because you blow out everybody else's light. When you try to destroy someone else's character, yours doesn't become better. But some people, they get blind. They can't see. You see, you're not a bigger person because you can tear down somebody else. Let me just mention this to you. As long as I've been married, I never say anything to anybody against my wife. I never point out anything 
Why would I want to do a thing like that? So I don't say things to anybody else that's mean and ugly and detrimental about my wife. I wouldn't do that. If you're not thinking right, you would. Because, you see, you've got to pull people down. Say things against somebody. You ought not do that. You ought not do that against your kids or against your husband or against your wife. You see, as you read in the book of Colossians in chapter 3, it'll talk to you about all the things you're supposed to do. Now, are we looking at some things right now God says not to do? See, the Christian life is not to be focused upon what you don't do, but what you are to do. But he says, you've got to take off something first, because I want you to put on something. Now, go back to the book of Colossians. You see in verse 8 where he says, But now ye also put off these. Look in verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is created in knowledge after the image of him that created him. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you got a new birth. It was born of God. Look up here just very quickly. I've used this before, but just to kind of help explain some of these scriptures. When you and I were born into this world, we have a flesh birth, physical birth. This is what you see. I have flesh body. My body has within it a sinful nature. Sins naturally. I don't want it. I wish I didn't have it. But I got it because I was born into this world. I got it from my mama and daddy. They got it from their mother and daddy. And all the way back to Adam and Eve, they did it to us. And here we are with a no sinful nature. We are naturally rebellious. We want our own way. And God says all of the desires that we have are sinful. It leads us astray. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. It leads to destruction because it leads us away from God. So, we are spiritually dead. I mean, spiritually separated from God, the source of life. So, when you and I trust Christ as our Savior, God doesn't change this one. He gives you a new birth. The new one is a spiritual birth. You can't see a spiritual birth. I can see your physical birth, but I can't see your spiritual birth. The spiritual birth is born by the Spirit of God. And that is being born again, born from above, by the incorruptible seed, the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So this birth came from this book, the incorruptible seed. This one came from the seed of my Father. A sinful nature. So now I have two births. This one can't do anything good. And this one can't do anything bad. And they're both living inside of this one body I've got. And they don't get along. They don't get along. Fight all the time. And when I want to do right, evil is present with me. And when I want to do this, this one is present with me. And so some Christians are so spiritually skinny they could use a cherry for a hula hoop. They don't have any strength or power at all to have any victory over the old sinful nature. So God says, you only got one body. But put off the old man. Don't let him control the body. I want you to let the new man control the body. Now he's there, but... I don't have to yield to the flesh. I have the flesh. I have the lust of the flesh. But if I satisfy those desires of the flesh, those desires will grow until they become like little monsters and destroy your life. But if I let the desires of the Lord control my life and I feed those desires, you don't feed the nature, but you feed the desires of the nature. And when I feed that desire to want to please God, the desire to want to have the rewards when I get to heaven. The desire that I have for His praise and for His honor and for His glory. When I feed those desires, it, they grow and they become strong. And He says, I think I have a cure. Shut up! You're not going to do that. Because I'm stronger. But if you don't do that, I think I'm going to go to church today. You are not. You're going to stay home and watch Batman. So you got this 
terrible war going on in your life. So God says, put off this one. Put on this one. And if you'll put this one on and let the Spirit control your life. And the Spirit controls your life by the Word of God. So that's why you read to study the Word of God. So that you'll know what God says to do and not to do. What's right and what's wrong. You say, well, I already know what's right and wrong. No, you don't. God does. It's not for every man to decide. It's for God to tell you what's right and what's wrong. How you're supposed to live. You want to get married? Here's the manual. Want to raise kids? Here's the manual. Want to start your business? Here's the manual. Got employees? Here's the manual. This book is the book. It's everything you and I need. Now, I want you to notice this. Down in verse 9. Lie not one to another. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. After the image of him that created him. Renewed in knowledge. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans in chapter 12 and verse 12, uh, uh, 1 and 2. He says, and be not conformed to this world. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. With the word of God. That you may prove or discover. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life? Did you know that you have a choice? You can ruin your life or you can do something with it. You can be what God wants you to be or you can be whatever you want to be. But you're only going to get one shot at it. You're going to have to live one time through life. No reruns, no instant replays, just one trip through. How you doing so far? How you doing? You see, you're wise when you can at least discern where you are and correct the problem and try to get back on track. If the devil knocks you off, get, get back up. He knocked you down five times, get up six. Just keep getting up all the time. Just stay up. Always keep getting up. Never let him win. Now, the verse of these verses down through here are awesome verses. Because I'm going to cover more about this in detail tonight. But for right now, I want you to see what God wants you to do when you renew your mind with the Word of God. How much do you think God wants you to know about the Word? Well, Paul put it this way, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Everybody needs counseling. Every time I preach, I'm counseling you. I'm counseling. If you listen to what I say, you'll never have to go to those shrinks out there, those psychiatrists. All you, you need this. This is what you need. You need the book. You need to know the Word of God. Now, listen to what it says. In uh, verse 12, I want you to look in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. You're His child. Chosen to serve him. See, God has chosen that every one of his children will serve him. But a lot of people don't. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Because that's your position in Christ. That's how God sees you. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Do you see anything different than you do over there in verse uh, 5 and 8? Anything different? You see, one is the old man and the other one is the new one. How do you think God wants you to live? You think that he wants you to have more love and peace and joy and happiness? That's what God wants. But you see, you think you'll have to get it your way. Your way won't work. It's temperate. There is pleasure in sin for a season. For a short period of time, yes, all all things. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Nobody would live in sin if it wasn't fun. Of course it's fun. But not for long. The great sorrow. So look what he says. In verse 13, when he makes a statement, forgiving one another. And he says, forbearing one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, get your gun. 
No, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Have, have you ever had anybody wrong you? Ever wrong you? What do you want to do? Give them a Hawaiian punch? Only in Christian love, because you just love to do it? Or are, are you strong enough in the Lord that you can forgive them? Forgive them. You know, some people would love for you to lose your cool, become angry and bitter at them, because that's the way they are. They would love to pull you down to their level. It's up to you. You can live however you choose to live. And understand this, you will live the way you really want to live. Now, you can't blame everybody under the sun. She made me do it. You made me mad. You offended me. But not without your permission. You have to give your permission for people to... That's why I've told people over and again, serve the Lord like you have never been hurt. Because if you don't, the hurt will turn to bitterness and then to anger and then to malice. And then filthy communications will come out of your mouth. Because the motives will be there and then the actions and that's what you find in verse 5 and also in verse 8. But look what he says. As you read down through here, and you, you just got to see this. You see in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart. To the which also ye are called in one body. And you ought to underline these three little words. Be ye thankful. Be thankful. Did you know that God says in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why do you got to have that? Because see, the Holy Spirit can't lead you contrary to the word. So as you study the word of God, the Holy Spirit, who is the author of this book, lives inside of you. And he will lead you and guide you. And he says in verse 16, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song and acid rock and everything else you want to listen to, it doesn't really matter. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Music does matter. The kind of music you listen to does matter. I believe it should be to the Lord, for the Lord, and about the Lord. Just a kind of a safety boundaries, you know. I don't mind patriotic stuff. I, I feel like I'm a little on the patriotic side. I don't mind a few songs about our country and so forth. But I don't like anything taking the place of the Lord who made the country. But look what he says. In the last part of verse 16, singing with grace in your hearts. To who? To the Lord. Whatever it is, can you sing it to the Lord? So this is what God means to me. A lot of the hymns, the reason I like them, because there's more theology in them. And most of them are pretty good theology. They got a lot of new songs out today. You don't know if they're singing to our God or to Allah. Any God will do. And we call it the 7-11. You know, they just mention seven words and say it 11 times. And you don't have a clue what in the world you're learning. I like a song that has a message. See, if I can't preach that message, you shouldn't sing that message. If there's not a message there to preach, then there ought not be a song that you can sing. Because the song ought to have a, a message to it. But God says, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. In verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed while you're down here on the earth. While you're on the earth, living in a body, whatsoever you do, do it. Look at the last part of the verse. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You do it because you're thinking about heaven. You're doing it for the Lord. And if you do it for him, then you want to make sure it's what he would accept. You want to make sure it would please him. So whatever you say, whatever you do, whatever you think, would it please him? Therein lies the key. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affections on things that are above. Because things down here come and go. 
And you're going to be one miserable individual if you don't get what you want and things don't happen the way you want it to happen. But you know that God sees and God is going to keep the books and he's going to reward you when you get there for everything you suffered while you were down here. So don't worry about it. That's the only way to enjoy the life. Otherwise you'll never enjoy life. You'll never be happy. Not truly happy. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. This wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. Now God says he loves us. Now he hates our sin. And for us to pay for sin, eternal separation from God. Well, since everybody's a sinner, everybody does things wrong. So we're all condemned, and the payment is a separation from the Lord in hell forever. So what are we going to do? Well, we can desire to go to heaven, but how do we get there? God says heaven is a perfect place. God's perfect. But because of sin, we can't get in. God says you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven by your good deeds. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. You'll never be good enough. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us, hates our sin because it separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who did not have to die because he had no sin, never did anything wrong. He came into the world and took all the sins of the whole world and paid for them on the cross and came back from the dead. And only those in the world, he says, whosoever. God so loved the world, whosoever of those people in the world. He says, if you believe he did it for you, you would not perish. You would get to go to heaven. So the world isn't saved, but he that believeth. You're the one that decides, will you believe that he did it for you? And if you'll believe he did it for you, he would put this payment to your account. You get to go to heaven on what he did for you. For God, God, so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Now, whosoever, believe it. All you had to do is believe it. Believe that he took your sins and paid for them. And he says, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. You go to heaven on what Christ did for you. There's no tricks to that. There's no gimmicks. That's the best news in all the world. And I pray that you'll trust Christ as your Savior. Let's pray, shall we? With head bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning, you say, Preach, I, you kind of lost me there for a little while. Well, friend, if I caught you right there at the end, if you understand this, God loves you. And we've done things wrong. And we ought to pay for it. But God loved you so much that he sent his son to pay for them. And said, if you'll believe he did it for you, that he would give to you as a free gift everlasting life. Would you trust him? Would you believe it? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, now's a good time to do so. We have no guarantee on life. Why not right now trust the Lord? as your only hope of going to heaven. Just in your own mind, just say something like this between you and the Lord. Lord, I don't understand it all. But I believe Christ died for me, and I'm going to trust him to take me to heaven when I die. And friend, if you're making that decision, I'd like to know it. I'd like to have prayer for you. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you stand up. But I'm going to ask you with your head bowed, nice clothes, if you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down. And by that, you just simply mean, preacher, I will trust Christ as my Savior. And I'd like for you to pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly? Anyone at all? Yes, God bless you, sir. God bless you. Smartest decision you'll ever make. There's no tricks to it, no gimmicks. Anyone else before we close? So that made sense to me. I also want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. And I will trust Christ as my Savior. Anyone else? Our Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your word you've given us. And Father, we thank you for the individual who we indicated by an uplifted hand by trusting you as his Savior. We know that you give him as a free gift everlasting life. That you'll never cast him out, never lose him. He can know that when he leaves today, I'm going to heaven. Because today I trusted Christ as my Savior. He died and paid for my sins. And Father, we ask now your special blessings upon the fellowship that we'll enjoy as we go to the fellowship hall. And we thank you for all the ladies that brought all the food and 
even some of the men that bring food and we just pray a blessing